Hey everyone, it's Ali, and today we're going to be talking about our first build guide for the launch of the game. Today we're going to be talking about Fred. Now Fred is a really fun minion build. This is going to be different from the majority of minion builds that you typically play in most RPGs, as instead of having an army of minions or specializing in a specific minion that we're going to be summoning a bunch of copies of, instead we're going to be focusing on just summoning a singular minion, which we are going to buff as much as we can to make it as strong as possible and that single minion is going to do all the work for us this minion honestly is going to be so strong that you are going to kind of be its minion because you're the one consistently buffing it while it does all the work fred is a really fun build this is one of the builds i pushed the furthest with in last epoch before the game came out and i think it's going to be a wonderful build for release simply because it really doesn't need anything to get going leveling it is really easy and for the three major items that are going to push this build to the opposite absolute moon in terms of power can all be farmed in the same exact zone at the same time very early into your experience into endgame meaning that you can get all of your power online very quickly without too much trouble and they can go around and upgrade your build from there this build is going to be a wonderful monolith farmer and it'll do a good job at farming it at about a medium pace or so and eventually once you get the experimental boot base that is going to make it so every time you use your teleport skill red teleports to you you are not gonna have to wait around for him to catch up to you as sometimes a little bit slow and it'll turn into an absolute monster for farming monoliths now this build is not going to be able to push to thousands and thousands of corruption this build is going to comfortably be able to farm around 300 to 500 corruption with no problem especially once you get your end game gear and honestly that's going to be more than enough to make quite a lot of money if you're playing in trade or to potentially let you farm gear to be able to play other builds this is meant to be a leak starter and it's not meant to be something that's super overpowered with a lot of really mandatory gear it's just meant to be something that's very easy to play and the nice thing about this is it's such low apm and doesn't really require much input from you that pretty much anybody can play it before we go any further i do want to mention one more thing this build guide is going to come out before the release patch notes are going to come out the patch notes are slated to come out two days before the game releases and i just don't want to hold all my build guides until then realistically nothing about this build is overpowered i don't think anything is going to be touched here other than low life since end game low life is kind of broken right now it's a little bit too powerful but realistically that shouldn't make much of a difference and if anything the experimental base for low life on gloves is going to be the thing that's going to be touched do be warned that there might be some changes but as soon as those changes are made i will immediately update the guide and i'll and i'll have a pinned comment below the video as well as in the description talking about any changes Changes that actually impact this. So this build is going to be split into two sections. First, we're going to talk about the leveling setup and how you'd actually level before you can start playing Fred, because this is not something you'd be able to play immediately. And leveling as a non-minion build is going to be substantially faster. And then we're going to talk about the gear they'd want to use for this, as well as some late game upgrades they can make for it. As always, cuties, as you can expect from my Path of Exile guides, I will always have a massive written section for everything we're going to be discussing, and all of these will be hosted on Last Epoch Tools. This will be linked in the description below and it basically goes over absolutely everything you need to know to be able to play this build if you want a written version of it there will also be a loot filter that will be linked in the description below which is handmade by me to help you level all the way from the beginning all the way into end game while at the same time also being an end game filter if you want to have a very easy setup all the way from the beginning of the game's launch all the way into an end game setup my filter and the written guide should take care of all the work for you not only that but if you go to the top of the written guide and you click on the build planner link what this will do is it will bring you over to the build planner where you can see all the gear in here and if you want you can go over to skills and move around the sliders to see how to actually progress all the skills as well as go over to the passive tree and be able to move the slider for the passive tree to be able to see how to progress all this now the first thing that we're going to want to talk about here is going to be how to actually level this now leveling is going to be pretty simple because we're playing accolades and accolade gets access to one very specific skill that makes it really easy to level spear plague now, Spirit Plague is going to be a poison-based skill, and the nice thing about it is it's just going to have such good clear and such high single target damage, they're going to have no problem leveling with it. The reason we're going to be picking this up is because we need 30 passive points in our Necromancer passive skill tree before we can pick up Dreadshade. The Dreadshade is going to be what's going to allow us to play with Fred and do enough damage to be able to swap over to a minion build. So until we have 30 passive points to put into our other passive trees, we are going to stick with Spirit Plague. Now, Spirit Plague is going to be very simple. All we need to do is first start off with playing Wandering Spirits as soon as we hit level 4. And then we're going to play Wandering Spirits along with Rip Blood and our minions until we hit level 8, at which point we're going to be swapping over to Haunting Souls. And we're going to be playing Haunting Souls and Wandering Spirits all the way until level 16. Once you have Spirit Plague unlocked, you're going to unspec out of both Wandering Spirits and Haunting Souls. And you're going to be respecking over into both Spirit Plague and Summon Volatile Zombies. 
The volatile zombies are going to be quite a lot of utility as well as heal you. And they're going to be proccing the passive point dark rituals for you, which is going to be quite a lot of cast speed, allowing you to cast your spirit plagues even faster. All this is going to be very easy to follow. And in the build variant section in the written guide, there is a step-by-step -step guide painfully detailing everything you need to do. There's also going to be a build planner linked in the build variant section. And if you go to this build planner instead, you will be able to see everything here as well. If I were to go to skills, for example, we would be able to look at the exact points you'd want to put into Wandering Spirits and the path you'd want to take. We'd also be able to see the same thing for Haunting Souls. And once we're ready to get rid of both these skills and swap over to Spirit Plague and Volatile Zombie, we can see the leveling path for both Volatile Zombie and for Spirit Plague. The final thing to mention about leveling is that your passive tree is going to be completely different than the passive tree you're going to want to play Fred with. The reason behind this being is that we're going to be playing a poison damage over time build and there's going to be substantially different points that we're going to want for that and there's going to be substantially different points that we want for Fred. So what this means is once you are ready to swap over to Fred at level 45, you are going to be respecking all of your passive points over to what it actually needs to be. Now the nice thing is that respects, especially early on to the game, are extremely cheap so this really won't be anything that bothers you, anything more than going over to the town, talking to the respec NPC, and then just simply regretting all of your points so you can pick them up as required. As for how you're going to be leveling this, again, this will be linked in the description below and it'll be part of the written build guide, but there will be a passive section that you can move a slider around to show you exactly how I would personally pick up all the passive points to get you all the way to 50 points. The whole point here is that we need a total of 50 points. No matter what, we are going to have to put 20 points into our Acolyte tree. And then we are going to need to put at least 30 points to get the Dread Shade. The reason we're not putting anything into Necromancer to begin with is because all these nodes are not very good for Spirit Plague. So we're going to be opting to put 19 points into Lich and 11 points into Warlock in a order that's going to give us the most damage as quickly as we can. And then we're going to be removing all the points in Warlock, all the points in Lich, and then putting our first 30 points into Necromancer to unlock Dread Shade. So now that we've gotten leveling out of the way, let's actually talk about this build and talk about how it works. This build is going to be very simple. Our whole build is going to be based around summon skeletal mage. The main thing here is that typically skeletal mage allows you to have a multitude of different skeletons. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to pick arc mage and what arc mage is going to do is it's going to remove our maximum amount of skeletons and instead it's going to allow us to only have one skeleton that's going to shoot twice as many projectiles and do 130% more damage. This effectively means that this one single skeleton is going to be as strong as 2.3 skeleton mages but at the same time it's going to have really great clear and it's going to have really great coverage. What we're going to be doing with this is we're then going to also be picking up Dreadshade. The reason it takes us so long to swap to this is because without Dreadshade, this one skeleton is just not going to do enough damage in comparison to Spirit Plague. Dreadshade is going to give us some really powerful buffs. What we're going to want to do with it is we're going to be wanting to take one for all. One for all is going to make it so Dreadshade can only be applied to a singular minion at, at once, but it's going to make it do 60% more damage. What we can also do with this is then also pick up Egoism. So that means our one skeleton is now going to also guarantee crit. We can now scale a lot of critical strike multiplier, which we can very easily do this with points of the passive tree, such as Blades of the Forlorn, which is going to give us 70% crit multi and 70% increased cold damage. And because of this, we can make our Fred do so much damage that's going to beat the damage that a bunch of skeletal mages could have normally done. The other nice thing about Archmage is the fact that it's going to give him 130% increased health, meaning that he is not going to really be squishy and he's going to be able to live basically all content, especially when we pair River Bones, which is going to give us 20% damage leached as health from any crits that our minions do, and it's going to increase their leech rate by 100%, effectively making them have 40% of all damage they do leech as health. And when Fred is going to be hitting so hard, he is going to be keeping himself alive through absolutely everything. You'll never have to worry about him dying to anything. To add on to all this, the other thing that's going to make us do so much damage is to run Lich of Scorn. What Lich of Scorn is going to do is it's going to give us 1% cold penetration for minions affected by Dreadshade per intelligence point that we have. And this is going to be great because this means that we also can then pick up Crown Mages on Summon Skeleton Mage to then benefit from the cold damage from Blades of the Forlorn, as well as benefit from all the cold penetration from Lich's Scorn. This then allows us to scale intelligence to the roof, which is going to give Fred a lot of damage, not only through the scaling of Lich's Scorn, but also just simply through the raw 4% increased damage that he has for getting a point of intelligence, meaning that we are now double dipping on intelligence in terms of scaling him. And because we're gonna have so much intelligence and there's so much ward based nodes on the passive tree for an accolade, we can very easily then take all this intelligence, play low life by using a Exsanguinous and a Last Steps of the Living, which are going to drain your health permanently and give you a portion of the health that you're missing as ward. 
And then we're going to be able to have a really big health pool and it's going to have a lot of recovery, which will make us super tanky. The other thing we can then add on to all this later on is the experimental glove base that gives us the same stat as Exsanguinous and as Last Episode Living, which is going to drain our health even harder, but give us another up to 20% of our missing health as extra ward. With all this put together, we are going to be absolutely tanky and it's going to be taking care of all of our issues. What we should talk about next is going to be all the other skills that are going to be supporting all this. So to add on to Dread Shade, we are also going to be picking up Infernal Shade. What Infernal Shade is going to do is with the Devour and Flames node, allow us to put the Infernal Shade on our minions, which means we can then put it on Fred. What this is going to do is it's going to make Fred take increasingly more and more damage, which we don't really care about due to River Bones completely out healing all of it. And then we're going to be picking up points such as Manic Pyre, which is going to give us up to 72% movement speed and cast speed for Fred, and Soul Fire, which is going to make it so last infinitely because we want Manic Pyre to scale to its maximum as it takes a few seconds to ramp up there and then we want to keep that as long as possible now because we have to pick up subjugation this does mean that the infernal shade is going to do more and more and more damage to fred to the point where he's going to just get one shot from it but that doesn't really happen until the infernal shade has been on fred for over a minute so it's really nothing we have to worry about and monoliths that just means we might have to resummon fred maybe two to three times throughout the echo which is really not that big of a deal now you don't even have to actually use infernal shade while doing monoliths this is only something you really have to press on bosses but if you want better clear especially before you get yourself the experimental boot base which is going to allow you to teleport fred with you every time you press transplant i would recommend for you to actually use it while monolithing but that is up to you it's mostly there just to be a single target dps increase and a clearing increase if you really want it to be the other skill that we're going to be adding on to this is going to be summon volatile zombie now summon volatile zombies are going to be incredibly powerful in this build because we are going to be able to use the numlock trick which we'll talk about here in a second to make them auto summon for us meaning we never have to actually press them manually while at the same time being able to pick up dreadful horde which means that we can just summon a pack of them at once it's only something that's going to interrupt us every once in a while these are going to be really great for utility because we're going to be able to pick up by the ward which is going to make it so every time they leap onto enemies and explode, they're going to give us a massive amount of ward, which can be thought of a way as getting a heal every few seconds. And it can be thought as another way of getting a little bit of a top up on your ward, even if you are seeing a full ward. The other really useful thing about them is with pull the grave, we're going to get 16% kill threshold, meaning we can kill bosses at 16% of their health, just effectively giving us 16% more DPS. And we can also pick up Corpse Bane, which is going to make it so they apply Mark for Death, meaning that Fred is going to do 25% more damage. Now, the thing to mention here is that you need to get these uniques before you can play low life. You can't just play with Exsanguinous or with Last Episode Living. You are going to need both of them at the same time to make this work. Now, the beautiful thing here about this build and the reason it's going to be such a strong season starter is because we can do all this at the same time. The way you're going to be getting Lich's Scorn is by fighting the boss in Blood, Frost, and Death. And the nice thing about Blood, Frost, and Death is it's the fourth island once you start a monolith. When you start a new season and you start in Fall of the Outcasts, you'll have to progress through Fall, then Black Sun, then any of the Storm. You have to do these three no matter what to get towards the top. What we can then do, instead of progressing towards the end of the game and unlocking powered monoliths, is instead just immediately come to Blood, Frost, and Death. And what we can do here is we can just go ahead and keep farming it over and over again. And the nice thing is, is that Lich's Scorn comes from the monolith boss that is available with blood frost and death while at the same time the benefit of doing blood frost and death is occasionally finding nodes that are going to give you a guaranteed legendary or set chest plate this means that we can farm for exsanguinous very easily and last steps of the living are also dropped from the same boss that lich's gorn is dropped from so all you're gonna have to do at the start of a season is simply sit there farm a few bosses from blood frost and death you'll get the boots and lich's gorn very quickly because rarity works on these bosses meaning for example if i had 100 percent rarity when i fought the boss i would double my chance of actually getting the lich's scorn and the boots and they're already a pretty decently high drop rate and while doing that and farming the stability to be able to fight the boss you'll be able to get a few chest weight nodes and hopefully get an exsanguinous which is a pretty common chest weight meaning that you can get everything that you need to go low life very quickly now what we should talk about is what you should do before you can go low life because you're going to need both pieces now you do not need lich's scorn lich's scorn is simply just something that you can immediately add on to your build whenever you want with no limitation but there are going to be some points that we're going to want to change in our passive tree before we actually swap to low life the biggest changes here are going to be swapping reclamation of souls which is going to give us word retention for elixir of hunger while at the same time in the base accolade tree we are not going to be picking up unnatural preservation and mania of mortality instead we're going to either opt to pick up blood aura to increase our minion damage or we're going to opt to pick up bone aura which is going to give us a lot more armor both these options are fine and it's up to you which one you want but the only changes we're going to be making once we do get the low life items is we're going to be swapping those back over to the word retention nodes as we don't care about word retention 
until we are ready to actually play this as a word build. Now, next up, I want to go over all the gear really quickly and some of the things that you might want to be on the lookout for. So the first two things to talk about here are Exsanguinous and Last Episode Living, which we briefly mentioned previously on how to both farm them and how to be able to swap over to low life. These are going to be pretty crucial to your defensive layers, and you are going to be a little bit squishy until you get them. But before you do get your hands on both of these, what you can do is simply just run a normal Exalted Chestplate and an Exalted Pair of Boots, and potentially, if you can, get yourself the experimented base that's going to allow you to teleport Fred around. You're not going to be able to keep that because Last Episode Living is so important, but ideally, if you want to get it really quickly, you can go and farm a bunch of Last Episode Living since getting one LP on them is really easy and keep throwing experimented teleport bases at them until you get the experiment to teleport base to stick onto your last episode living. For our offhand, our only real choice here is Lich's Corn. Until you get it, you just run whatever offhand with some life on it that you can get. There's not any good minion stats on them. And Lich's Corn is so easy to get that we just immediately want to get it. For our weapon, ideally we're going to eventually want to use a Chronostasis because it can give us so much word per second in intelligence. But until you get your hands on one of these, the only useful stat on a weapon for all minion builds period is just minion spell damage, which is a suffix. It's really easy to get and you can pretty much just pick up any random sword off the ground and just simply use a few minion spell damage epic shards on it and you have yourself a best and saw weapon pre chronostasis but eventually you'll want to get yourself a chronostasis which is pretty easy to farm in reign of dragons for our final unique that we really care about here is going to be a death rattle death rattle is pretty easy to get and just gives us so much extra benefits to our builds by giving us a lot of crit multi and some intelligence that is pretty hard to skip out on it you can use just a generic health amulet until then and this is not a hard requirement to be able to put this together for the rest of our gear we're just simply going to try to fit as many resistances as possible in all of our gear our belt our rings our relic and our helmets are all going to be used for getting as much resistances as possible as well as ideally trying to get as much intelligence as we can we can put intelligence on every single one of these items and we want to try and fit as much as we can in an end game setup you're eventually going to be able to hit somewhere around 100 to 110 intelligence and it'd be really nice to be able to get that but anything around 70 to 80 intelligence is more than enough the final thing i might want to mention here is potentially getting yourself a blessing for critical strike avoidance and then getting yourself a critical strike avoidance roll on either your rings or your belt to be immune to critical strike other than that, in terms of stats, once you are playing low life, you're going to want to get health everywhere since health is going to be the best way for you to gain more ward. And then finally, you're going to want to get yourself mini damage on your belt, on your rings, and on your helmet. You're going to try to look for skeletal mage damage. This is also a role they can get on your chest plate if you don't have an exsanguinous, but eventually you are going to want to swap the exsanguinous pretty quickly. That's going to be something you're not going to be able to keep. The final thing to mention here is going to be your relic. On your relic, you're going to ideally try to look for a plus two to plus three extra levels of skeletal mage if you can. But if you can't get your hands on one of those, just anything with minion damage, intelligence, and health is really good. All this gear and all the stats that you want on it are discussed further in the gear section on the written guide. So I'd recommend to look here if you want to know what the ideal bases and the ideal stats are to get on everything here. You don't need to have these exact stats to make this build work. As long as you have intelligence and health everywhere, that's all you really need to have a very good build put together. Finally, the last little bit of gear that I want to talk about are going to be idols. Idols in this build are going to be very simple. Ideally, you're going to want to get yourself four large immortal idols with increased health and word retention on them. These are going to make you substantially tankier and our build is going to do so much damage already that we don't really care about any sort of damage stats. For the four other slots that you have, I would ideally recommend to get one by two large Lagonian idols with as much percent health and any sort of resistance they need on it. These can roll elemental resistance, fire resistance, lightning resistance, and cold resistance, and these will be a way for you to be able to fit the rest of these rolls in. The final thing that I want to talk about for this build is going to just be a few tips and tricks that I've personally picked up that honestly make this build feel substantially easier to play. The first one that I want to talk about is going to be setting up your minion attack move key. If you go over to your settings and go over to change input keys and if you scroll down a little bit you'll be able to find a key binding that says specifically minion attack command. Personally I put mine on spacebar and what this means is if I were to summon my minions no matter which minions they are and I press spacebar I can tell my minions where to go. The nice thing about this is if I target a enemy with this, it will automatically make my minions attack that enemy. Now, unfortunately, this is not an attack move, which means if I were to click over there, my minions wouldn't immediately go after whatever is in front of them, but it can kind of be used as an attack move if you specifically hover over whatever enemy you want to use. 
The other thing I want to talk about here is going to be the numlock trick they can do for pretty much any builds that this is beneficial for and our build is going to be very beneficial. Currently, if I wanted to press my volatile zombies, I'd have to manually summon them every single time they're active. Now, this might be okay to some people, but honestly, for this build and how little APM we're trying to get in here, that's going to be a little bit too much effort. So instead, what we could do is we could do something like this, where my minions are now going to auto summon themselves every time they're active. So right here, I'm just holding down left click. I'm not doing anything special. And every time you see my characters stopping to cast these, they are manually casted for me. The way this is done is by simply going into your settings and setting whatever keybind you're going to have the spell that you want to be auto casted for you be also added to your keypad. So for example, in my case, I have ability five as the key that I use to numlock. You can leave this as a normal key and then add a secondary binding to it. But all you have to do is simply just set it to a keypad key. So in my case, keypad nine. And then all I have to do is turn on numlock. So my keypad actually works. I am then going to hold down numpad nine. As you can see here, the button is grayed out because I'm actually holding the key. And then while holding down the key, I'm going to hit numlock again to turn it off. As you can see, with me taking my hands off of my keyboard, the button is still pressed down and it will stay pressed down like this until I turn numlock back on or until I tab out of the game. So as long as I don't tab out, as long as I don't leave like this and come back, the key will always be pressed. As you can see here, I tabbed out so the key is not pressed anymore, but it's just as simple as turning on numlock again, holding down the key and turning off numlock while the key is pressed down. As you can see, my zombies will be permanently resummoned by themselves. This makes it feel substantially better. And unfortunately, you can't do this for something like Infernal Shade, because if I were to numpad Infernal Shade, my character would just sit here and just keep spamming it without me doing anything else. It has to be some sort of ability that has a cooldown. Otherwise, you're just going to make your character effectively be stunlocked, spamming the skill over and over again. And that's all I have to say for this guide. I absolutely love Fred. This is one of my favorite builds of all time and I've had so much fun pushing into deep end game with it and min-maxing the build as far as possible. It feels so comfy to play and I love it that this effectively allows me to play a one minion build. It's something you can't really experience in most games as unfortunately one minion builds are just a little bit too weak. But in Last Epoch, with Archmage and with all the scaling we can get at Dreadshade and Infernal Shade, we can make a very strong one minion build. If you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to leave a comment in the description below. I'll be more than happy to help you as soon as I can. And if you want to come by my Twitch, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have there. I stream every single day and I plan to play Last Epoch for the next few days leading up to launch and then to play for about a month to a month and a half before the next POE season. So if you just want to come hang out with all the cuties and talk about Last Epoch or have any questions about this build, I'll be more than happy to help you live as well. Other than that, cuties, I hope you enjoyed the build guide and I'll see you in the next video.